All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So um, I am blessed to be with each one of you. Um, there you see my research topic. I am uh, Aize Sebader. And, you know, I'm an active uh, Black Twitter, uh, Twitter, Twitter historian. So if you want to tweet at me, I put my uh, tweet handle at Aize S. I've already uh, posted some things on Twitter. And so if you want to talk, talk, talk with me, go ahead and, and, and hit me on Twitter. So I want to go ahead and um, not only continue the conversation, but I want to also start the conversation. You know, my topic here, Montessori research in the Black, um, will explore my journey as um, a Black person. So that will be my um, racial Blackness. Um, and then I will also explore the research Blackness, the, the, the wealth of uh, Montessori research in the Black. And then I will also explore the vast cosmic Blackness of research opportunities. So we're going to explore triple Blackness uh, in our uh, presentation today. So we're going to go to the next one. Uh, Dr. Maria, yes, yes, next one. Perfect. All right. So again, I want to you know, welcome each of you to the um, ERA, AERA um, research uh, SIG for Montessori. So again, I say welcome to you all to this presentation. If this wasn't a presentation you wanted to be at, then you are in the wrong place and you might want to get on a new Zoom link. <laughs> but if you uh, are in the right place, then again, I say welcome to you. Now, I would be remiss if I did not start by giving thanks. So first, I want to give thanks to God as a spiritually grounded person. I acknowledge the creator uh, and I give thanks for life, for strength, for health. I want to also give thanks for my ancestors, those whose uh, blood, sweat and tears have allowed me to be here today um, to be with you all right now to see your smiley, beautiful faces. <laughs> I also want to give thanks to uh, my indigenous brothers and sisters um, who stewarded the land upon which we reside, if you're here in the United States, at least. Uh, you know, so I'm here in the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. So that would be um, folk of the Piscataway Nation, the Susquehannock, uh, the Shawnee, and many others who helped to steward the land. If you would, you know, I'm a um, you know, I'm a spiritually grounded brother, you know, uh, a minister, so you got to talk with me. So why don't you put in the chat if you know uh, the, the land upon which, you know, what native group helped to steward that land. Put that in the chat if you would, so you could, again, we want to have a conversation. I also would be remiss if I did not give thanks to Drs. Angela and Stephanie for um, helping to organize. Yes, I agree, um, Sister Barbara. They have helped to organize a fantastic uh, conference and I have learned so much. And so thank you. Um, I wanna give thanks to each and every one of you who thought it not robbery to steal some time out of your day so that we might be able to all uh, get together. And I wanna definitely give a special shout out to uh, my MSJ fam, uh, Montessori for Social Justice, uh, of which this presentation, you know, again, I was just reflecting on some of the presentations that I was in yesterday and looking at the lineup for today and it's MSJ all in the house and so you know definitely if I started naming names I wouldn't I would miss somebody and so again MSJ um, yes you 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 actually you will even see I have a picture of MSJ in there and then I also would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the BMEF uh, the Black Montessori Education Fund and I would like to make a special note that uh, from the BMEF you actually have uh, both of your keynoters are uh, founding advisory board members of the Black Montessori Education Fund. <laughs> All right, so I wanna um, go to our next slide. And with this slide, I want to just focus a little bit on positionality. So positionality, that is my social context. I think uh, Paula Giddens years ago wrote her fame, one of her famous books, you know, when and where I enter, huh? So where do I enter? I enter as a, a black man. Um, if, if you didn't notice, I'm, I'm, I'm black, if you, if you didn't know. <laughs> a black cisgender 
uh, middle class, um, you know, educated uh, person. And so it's interesting that when you look at positionality, you have, um, you know, there's an intersection of just who you are. And I think on one hand, you know, while because of just the historical context of America, my race might put me at a disadvantage, my um, ableism or my even gender might put me at an advantage. And so how do you reckon that, um, that intersectional positionality? Also, I just wanted to situate myself as one of the founding co, you know, co-founding board members for the Montessori for Social Justice. You see the picture there. Um, and you'll see several of the presenters. I'm seeing Dr. Luce right there. I'm seeing, you know, Tricia right there. I'm seeing uh, Katie right there, you know, and who's left out of the picture. We don't have a mirror in the picture. We don't have, a, you know, a mirror in the picture. And so um, MSJ definitely is in the house. So shout out to MSJ. All right, if we're gonna go to the next. So, I wanna first talk about my first layer of blackness. That would be my research um, in my experience as a black person. So we're gonna to go to the next slide. And as a um, researcher, what I realized, and so this is the first layer of my blackness. Um, and that would be my research into blackness. And what I realized, you want to go back one slide. <laughs> what I realized is that my research interests have been forged in the crucible of my lived experience as a black man in the United States of America, where, um, and if I, if I could, I have to give a, a quick story. You know, um, you know, ministers like to give stories. I got to give a quick story. <laughs> so I'm blessed I see, um, you know, I grew up in um, Crooklyn, New York. Uh, you know, uh, some would say the concrete jungle where I went to uh, Midwood High School. In fact, uh, Midwood, um, you all might have seen some of the recent congressional hearings where Rep Representative, uh, you know, Hakeem Jeffries is coming straight out of Brooklyn, you know, also a Midwood, uh, Midwood Hornet. <laughs> and, you know, I can remember at Midwood my last year, I was taking a constitutional law class, and um, there at Midwood, I remember, I, I remember like it was yesterday. My professor uh, was bringing up, um, well, what do you think about you know racism today? And you know, what do you think about some of these landmark constitutional you know law you know cases that came up? Plessy versus Ferguson, Dred Scott, Brown versus the Board of Ed, and I remember. Um, in class, and I was, you know, maybe not as reserved as I might be today. Well, some might say I'm not reserved, but uh, you know, I might not be as reserved as I am today. And I remember arguing down my classmates, like, "What are you talking about? Racism? Like they had with Dred Scott and Plessy versus Her that was like a hundred years ago. What are you talking about? There's no racism. What do you get over it? Come on, don't you see Midwood? How you know how diverse Midwood is? Get over it. And you know." Maybe back then I was, uh, you know, Brooklyn folk, Brooklyn comes hard. They, I was, you know, um, bombastic, maybe dogmatic. And I literally remember one of my classmates almost argued her into tears talking about, no, there is no racism. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so fast forward to, um, I went to, in fact, uh, I had a uh, inspirational history teacher, Miss Grace Garofolo. Um, hey, Ms. G, uh, who invited, well, not invited me, she suggested that I um, consider a historically black college to go to. And, um, you know, she suggested, well, why don't you think about, you know, Morehouse College? You might be able to network with the uh, talented 10th of the black community. Why don't you consider Morehouse? I said, Morehead? I'm not going to know Morehead. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't even know the name of the school. She said, well, why don't you just go visit? So, all right, I went to visit myself and another uh, classmate from Midwood. And again, we didn't really know anything about Morehouse. Um, we just knew it was deep South and we definitely weren't even thinking about, but we took the midnight train to Georgia, went down to uh, Morehouse. And if you all have never been to the AUC Atlanta University Center, it is beautiful. 
Um, you know, and like, as I like to say, the grass was green, the bees were buzzing, the birds were chirping, and the sisters were walking across Spelman's yard. And so if you don't know, Morehouse is the all male historically black college in Atlanta, Georgia, that is situated across the street from the all female uh, <laughs> um, historically black college of Spelman. And so all I had to do was see the sisters from Spelman. I put my application in on the spot. <laughs> in fact, both myself and my colleague, uh, Steve Bracey. In fact, Steve is still living in Atlanta. Um, Atlanta got a hold on him, brother. All right, so we both got into Morehouse by the grace of God. In fact, while we were there, we checked on folk. We checked on our application. You know, I'm, I'm in DC, so they say, every day. We checked on it every day. <laughs> hey, had y'all looked at our application yet? Had you looked at our application? Every day we were there. All right, so we get into Morehouse, and I tell you this because in the freshman week packet of Morehouse, they had a book that they strongly encouraged all freshmen to read. The book that they had in the freshman week packet was Carter G. Woodson's Miseducation of the Negro. <laughs> I read Carter G. Woodson's Miseducation of the Negro. Negro. My RA said, well, wow, if you really like that, well, here, let me, let, me, let me give you this. He gave me Malcolm X's autobiography. And then somebody said, well, if you like that, well, why don't you read this one? And they put a Sada Shakur's autobiography in my hand. So I would like to say that I got hit over the head by Carter G, Malcolm X, and a Sada Shakur. And it was, my mind was blown. At that point, I became, I guess, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, they might say a race person or a race man. And I realized that I had been robbed of learning about my culture, my roots. I had been robbed of learning about from whence I had come and the great achievement of many of my ancestors. And so I became, um, yeah, definitely, immersed in my black culture and so much so that I was blessed to take uh, history under the famed uh, historian, Dr. Alton Hornsby Jr., who was um, one of the longest editors of the Journal of Negro History. In fact, at that point, he was the second, long, second longest editor of the Journal, Negro, his, of Journal of Negro History, second only to Carter G. Woodson himself. And so Dr. Hornsby was no joke. Dr. Hornsby had a, a famous, or some might say an infamous class called Great Men and Women of History. And he used this phenomenal methodology where you had to learn about the, in fact, he looked at the, I guess it would be the, the theory, the great man theory um, of Alan Toynbee, um, who, looked, who said that if you study history through the lens of a great person, then you might understand the nuances of the time. So Dr. Hornsby used that methodology, that framework to have us study great men and women throughout history. And I was blessed to study um, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, and it blew my mind, the methodology. Not only did you have to research this stuff, you had to research using materials that Dr. Hornsby had read all of the books that he assigned you. And so you really couldn't uh, fudge too much because he was well you know, immersed in the, in the literature. And then you had to then come before your prayer, your uh, peers to argue your case on whether this person lived up to the criteria of greatness. And so I did that and it would blew me away. And I then started to work with young children and say, well, why don't I use that methodology with young children? And so I adapted that methodology, that great men and women methodology. And there you will see, um, one of the uh, first books that I did was Telling Children Our Story. So my method is tacos, telling children our story or the great person's uh, methodology where I use Dr. Hornsby's great men and women methodology to teach children about luminaries. And that one won us a White House award, um, which was presented by First Lady Michelle Obama in, at the White House itself. So I was blessed and um, in that. And again, this is a culturally relevant pedagogy. So, you know, thank you so much, Dr. Luce, for presenting uh, yesterday and talking of culturally relevant pedagogy, which again, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings helped to coin that phrase. And she actually talks of it as a pedagogy of oppression. 
Dr. Billing says that there are several key features of um, CRP, culturally relevant pedagogy. The three that I would like to lift up would be one of black excellence. The second, be, the second would be that of encouraging our students to develop cultural competencies. And the third would be there is a critical consciousness that we want to go ahead and challenge our students to really realize. Those are some of the core components that Dr. Gloria Latson Billings talks about of CRP, culturally relevant pedagogy. And that's what I used in my uh, methodology of telling children our story, tacos. Now, this book came out literally the same year that I was getting ready to go to grad school. So, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy, at least so I think. Uh, so I, uh, I say, well, all right, well, why don't you go ahead and use this culturally relevant pedagogy as the basis for your doctoral research? Huh? You already, you know, you already have a certain level of knowledge around culturally relevant pedagogy. That's brilliant, Aize. Yes, that's what I'll do. So I went into grad school thinking that I was going to do my research study on culturally relevant pedagogy. And I got, uh, so I got hit in the head to immerse myself in the black culture. And then I got hit in the head to immerse myself in studying family engagement. So folk in the hood might say, well, what had happened was, uh, well, how I got hit over the head with family engagement, here is what happened. I was working with a, in fact, my church, and we were working with a broad-based civics organization called Action in Montgomery that engages in direct action organizing. And they were actually working on getting some um, funding to start some after school programs, getting some funding for housing, getting some funding for job programs. And they were organizing, um, working on trying to get some of the elected officials in the you know, county where we live in to listen to their cause. And they were so effective Hold on, let me let me back up. Before I leave Morehouse, I gotta go ahead, um, before you leave Morehouse, to tip my hat to one of the most well-known Morehouse brothers, that being Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who today is his uh, born day. So I would want to definitely tip my hat to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and say, you know, if you haven't had a chance to read anything by Dr. King, you know, this weekend, you know, of course, his celebration will come up on Monday. I would encourage, strongly encourage you to read some, you know, Dr. King and don't just talk about the I have a dream speech. Maybe pick up letter from a Birmingham jail. Maybe go a little further and, you know, listen to his beyond Vietnam speech or his three evils of, you know, well, check out some something else other than I have a dream on Dr. King this, uh, this King weekend. All right, so this group, Action in Montgomery, they were engaged in direct action organizing. And I marveled at how this group was able to literally have politicians change their position on saying that they weren't gonna fund some community-based things to being able to pressure these elected officials through several different strategies. And so what I thought was, man, this is really powerful and what if I look at how this group is working on making some educational advances? And at this time, you know, they're in grad school, you're reading all of these luminaries. I was reading stuff by Ron Edmonds. I was reading stuff by Ken Haskins. I was reading stuff, of course, by Dr. Glory Latson Billings. I was reading stuff by Dr. Joyce King, reading these tremendous things. And many of them kept talking about the importance of families in the process, the importance of families in the educational process. And so I said, man, I got to go ahead and look at how this particular group was engaging families to change the performance, not only of their children in, in the educational setting, but also the schools were actually changing based on this, these families who were being involved. And so if we go to the next slide, so I got hit on the head with this piece around family engagement because um, I saw with my own eyes how these families were able to, to make a difference in what was happening. And so out the window with my culturally relevant pedagogy uh, 
thought of doing the research. And so again, my, my mindset going into grad school was I'm gonna do all my papers. I'm gonna do all my research projects. My lit, my lit review is all gonna be on you know, culturally relevant pedagogy. Now I was halfway through my doc program when I got hit over the head with family engagement and my peers said, you must have slipped and bumped your head because you have a body of research <laughs> that you already have for culturally relevant pedagogy. Why are you gonna change it now, Aize? And I was like, I gotta do it. I got it. This family engagement just keeps, it just is waking me up at night. <laughs> and so there you will see some of the research that I did. The um, Black Child Journal article was maybe in 2017. Then you see my first peer reviewed article was there, um, Jump, um, Authentic Family Engagement with the Counter Narrative and Self-Determination. That was 2018. Then 2019, um, Full Parent Partnership um, is another recent work. And so now my research interests have, I wouldn't say have changed because I'm still interested in cultural development pedagogy. It has just been added to. <laughs> and so that is my research in the Black. And what I would say here is, whereas culturally relevant pedagogy was born out of the my Blackness in terms of my racial positionality, this one is the second layer of Blackness. And that's, uh, I'm going I'm to steal from the business sense when they say we're in the Black, right? We're in the Black is to say that you are profitable, to say that you may have made some money on something as opposed to being short in the red. <laughs> and so here I'm in the black because there is a wealth of resources and research opportunities when you start to look at all that's happening within um, the black community. And so my um, foray into family engagement was primarily working with um, black individuals, but really is, is BIPOC individuals, primarily black, indigenous, people of color. Um, and so most of those studies, those are the, the people who I'm mainly interacting with, um, you know, BIPOC individuals. And so that's the second layer of blackness that I want to lift up today, that there is just a wealth of research opportunity in this field. All right, let's go to the next slide, if that's okay. All right, and in this um, realm of, of wealth within the, the Black research arena, I then was blessed to um, stumble upon uh, researching Montessori uh, in, in the Black, huh? And so let me give you a quick story, and I'm, I'm watching my time, so all right. <laughs> all right, so quickly, um, my, I'm one of a group of founding um, board members for a Montessori public charter school in DC, um, Shining Stars Montessori. And, you know, we had a really interesting startup story. And, you know, we've impacted, you know, hundreds and hundreds of families. We primarily wanted to uh, attract uh, black and brown children. Um, at first, maybe we might have done better than, you know, what happened later on. And if you look at the work of, you know, Mira Debs, she talks about how the chartering process uh, might factor out and impact um, black and brown, you know, BIPOC populations. So Dr. Uh, Mira Debs was actually uh, working on completing her book and she was coming to DC for the um, American Montessori um, Society AMS a uh, presentation for their Montessori event. And she was gonna feature um, some of the, how did uh, Mira call it? She said the, the dynamism within the Montessori movement. So she wanted to explore some of the dynamism within the Montessori movement by looking at, uh, as she calls it, um, un hidden figures, you know, almost, you know, unsung heroes uh, who have, have done some trailblazing work within the Montessori arena. And so she asked myself and a few other um, founders from not only my school, but some other um, Black Montessorians to be on her panel because as she was doing her work for, you know, um, her book, she came across these unsung, you know, hidden figures. All right, so we did the panel there and it was a huge success. It was such, uh, such a success 
that Mira said, hey, Aize, why don't you go ahead and I'm gonna be you know, away. I'm not gonna be able to go to the MSJ, the Montessori for Social Justice Conference. Why don't you go ahead and do another panel and you know, again, when when Mira calls, you got to answer, right? <laughs> so I said, sure, Mira, that, you know, no problem. And there you will see um, the article from Montessori Public, and um, the panel was well received. In fact, you know, um, it was so well received that um, David Ayers, who you know helps, I don't know if I want to say shepherd uh, the Montessori Public asked me to go ahead and write up something about that particular panel. So there you see that there. Um, and in fact, then I see uh, Jackie on the line. So you'll even see uh, uh, Jackie Miller there as she's one of the, you know, and we wanted to feature Black Montessorians in history. And so it was a phenomenal panel. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then you will see me talking about um, Black Montessorians in Washington, D.C. In fact, um, just sliding off the um, founding board for the Washington Montessori Institute 2.0. Uh, and uh, we have been trying to work on developing a strategic partnership with Howard University. So for AMI, this would be the first strategic partnership with an HBCU. So it's really a big deal. So we've really been pushing it hard. And you will see an article right there in the AMI journal on our uh, panel that we did, Montessori and DC and the DC area's black community. And if you were able to zoom in, you will see on the panel behind me um, is uh, Ma'ati, uh, yesterday's keynoter. She was on the panel, just like she dropped the mic yesterday, she dropped the mic on the panel too. <laughs> um, and then my latest uh, work in terms of Montessori um, research is, uh, Hidden Black Voices in the History of Montessori Education, where I was blessed to work with none other than our conference's uh, organizer, uh, Dr. Angela Murray, um, Dr. Luz, uh, myself, and uh, one of Dr. Murray's uh, students, uh, Ms. Clark. And that one recently came out. So this has been some of my um, journey into, um, again, the richness of, uh, what you find in the black community. And again, my work has primarily been um, around blackness. <laughs> and now I'm actually just working with um, Dr. Luce and I are extending what I did for my dissertation where my dissertation focused on family engagement and its impact on a child's academic performance. And that one was a mixed method um, study. Um, this research that I'm doing now with Dr. Luce, we actually are merging the Montessori research interests that both she and I have with family engagement. So now we're looking at how Montessori schools are engaging uh, families. All right, so I see my time is running. So let me just go and I don't need to spend, oh, let me just give one quick thing, you know, I gotta give a teaser. So uh, from that research, we are, uh, we finished our pilot and we actually, not only are looking at those, so yeah, when you do, re that's why research is so fascinating because you have some things that you might've hypothesized, but then there are some unintended blessings that you get. And Dr. Luce actually just stumbled upon something that we didn't even expect. So we are seeing a pattern of a difference. And so this is a teaser to let you know, you're gonna have to look for our article when it comes out. <laughs> there is a, a, a pattern between those families who the parents were Montessorians themselves and a difference in their level of understanding of Montessori juxtaposed to those individuals who just sent their children to Montessori school. And so we're seeing a significant difference between those two different groups, which again is an unintended um, blessing and research that we didn't even imagine. All right, let's go to my last slide and let me finish up so as I see my time. I see time is always running. <laughs> all right. So what I want to leave you all with is the third layer of blackness. This is um, blackness in the cosmos. This is blackness in the stratosphere. This is blackness in, you know, in fact, some researchers might talk about the dark matter, that there is actually more dark matter out there than there is light, right? <laughs> and so we need to go ahead and realize that there is a wealth 
of research opportunities that we can be considering. So I've just put a few up there for you all. Again, we have, we are blessed that even in this conference, you're gonna have Trisha McKino and you know, Sister Trisha helped to found the um, Indigenous, Montessori Interest, um, Indigenous Montessori Institute, where they literally just graduated one of the largest um, cohorts of Native American Montessorians. I mean, that's a tremendous, that's, that's a, a wealth of research opportunity right there. I mean, you could look at what are their lived experience. You could, somebody can design a longitudinal study to really follow these individuals for a significant period of time. And then you can even compare how their experiences fare with Montessorians of the global majority, you know, so whether it be black, whether it be Latinx, you know, and so again, that's a wealth of research potential. You could also consider doing some research in terms of what is the ecosystem that's happening um, amongst black Montessorians? Who's out there? Where are they? What are the levels they're doing their work? What are some of the outcomes of their work? I mean, it's a wealth of research that you could do there. And in fact, I think um, Dr. Mira Deb, she talks about this in her book also, um, Diverse, um, Diverse Families, Desirable Schools. She talks about how many of the Montessori body, um, Montessori organizational groups don't collect data on race. And so when we try to disaggregate the data to understand what's going on, many of them don't collect it. And so it's hard then to know who's doing what and where they are. And we're trying to change that, but it's hard to track that down. Um, you almost gotta you know, do it yourself again. It's just like, ah. All right, then you could uh, of course look at the lived experience of those black individuals. Somebody could do a randomized control um, test to look at the quantitative and quantitatively analyze some of the outcomes between Montessori public schools, particularly as they impact and work with children of the global majority. In fact, I just had a research, not a researcher, I just had a funder, you know, tell me, well, Aize, what's where's the where's the empirical, you know, evidence? Where's the data that talks about Montessori? And we have a lot of anecdotal, you know, stories, but we don't have some. We don't have as many hardcore, you know, quantitative studies. I mean, of course, you know, doing some of the qualitative work is good also. However, we need some, you know, RCT studies that really empirically demonstrate what's going on within the Montessori um, public sector. Somebody could do a mixed method comparative study between Montessori public schools, Montessori private schools, particularly as it impacts students of the global majority. Um, again, I think that, you know, and I really appreciated uh, Dr. Lee's presentation yesterday, where she pointed out the difference between how you might have a researcher outside of the community and how you might have a researcher in the community and how that might lead to some different results. So she spoke about who's in the room and who's doing the study makes a huge impact. She spoke of how when Moynihan did his study, he came out with one set of um, data points, but then when you had a, uh, a a black researcher, he came up. So Moynihan came up with a deficits-based um, set of data points, whereas the black researcher came up with a you know a, a asset, a strength-based. Uh, you know, and so again, who's in the room makes a huge difference. And so you know, not only who is involved in the research, but what are the tools that are even being used? Because many of the even the, the instruments that we used are normed on the white population. And so that might not necessarily relate to some of the BIPOC individuals that we're, you know, so who's designing even some of the, you know, psycho, using psychometrics to go ahead and design some instruments that are normed on BIPOC, on BIPOC individuals. Um, and then not only who, you know, who are the researchers, what are the tools, who are even the subjects and how are you even engaging the subjects so that the subjects aren't being suffocated, I think is what uh, uh, Dr. Lee said in her presentation yesterday, so that they aren't having their voices suffocated. And so again, these are some things that I would like us to consider. Uh, I see I am over my time, so I'm gonna zip my lip if you wanna go to my last slide. Um, and then we're gonna open it up for whatever remaining time we have for questions. So last slide, if that's okay. Yeah. And what I want to do is just as I open, I want to end um, my last slide. I welcomed folk and I gave thanks. So I want to um, also 
welcome you all to my world and my reality. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but I also want to give thanks for this opportunity to present. And you will see, as soon as my last slide comes up, um, I have a picture there from when I graduated. Um, and there you will see, um, I am anchored by not only my family, but by two great uh, teachers in my life. One is Miss Grace Garofolo, who you know is, is, is right there, um, who came down from New York to you know, uh, see me get that hood. Um, and you will also see uh, uh, Dr. Carol Perino, who was my statistician on my committee, who uh, you know, is helping to keep me honest with my stats. <laughs> Um, and then again, you know, if you want to get at me, you know, at Aize S on Twitter, you see my email there at, you know, um, you know, in the office at AMI USA. If you are interested in some of my research, you can go to our website, nmconsulting.org. And, um, you know, I know everybody's on mute. I was going to say, y'all can give me a drum roll, please. Well, even while you're on mute, go ahead, unmute yourself. Give me a drum roll, please. All right, and if you are interested, you can join us for the Montessori Experience, February the 12th. We are gonna have a phenomenal research panel where we actually have none other than Dr. Uh, Dr. Angela Murray, Dr. Angeline Lillard. We have uh, Dr. Paige Bray. We have Amira uh, Mugaji. We have, uh, we even have some other presenters. I'm not even remembering on the panel, but it is a phenomenal panel. <laughs> And I'm gonna make some breaking announcements even during that. So please, you don't wanna miss us. I'm really excited for it. And again, I am truly thankful for the opportunity to present with you all. I'm gonna zip my lip and maybe you got some questions for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aize, for those inspiring words and all of the, you know, the suggestions about research or whatever, it was just so, so rich. I am gonna help you moderate your questions. So if people have questions in the chat and they wanna type them, then I will read them out. And if you have a question um, you know, now, you can use the raise the hand button um, on your uh, screen and then we will, we'll, we'll see you and Aize will call on you and I'll help him spot people too. Does that work? Oh, Dr. Stephanie, if it's all right, just feed me the questions that you see in the chat that you think I might do well to consider. Okay, I don't have oh, I don't have any questions yet. So we're open. We'll open the floor to someone who wants to um, to do a live question, a spoken question. I one question about the event in February: how to log into oh. that panel in February. So if you go to the AMI USA website, you will see the Montessori experience and follow the link, and that will take you there. <laughs> So I hope that answers it. If, if you can out, you can also say, um, I'm not seeing a lot in the chat yet either. So you guys can just speak out too. I think we'll be able to do that. Uh, okay, I have one here. It's from Maria. It says, I'd love you to say a bit about equity and research dissemination. How does research get into hands of those who need it, especially ABA, ABAR work? ABAR work. <clears throat> so I think, and that's why, so, so thank you so much for that question, one. And what I would want to say is we, you know, here at, you know, ERA, AERA, you know, we got a bunch of researchers in the house, which is tremendous. What I realized though, is that the academy um, is just a better built cell block, I think is what uh, most Dev said. And even when I just published with Dr. Murray, um, I, you know, I wanted to share it. You know, I'm like, wow, this is great. We, find, we got published this one, and Dr. Murray will correct me. I think it's a double blind peer reviewed study. I'm like, wow, that's tremendous. Yeah, I want to share it. And she's like, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. You can't send that out. No, you can't do that. That's how they make their money. <laughs> so when you publish, you got to go ahead and be mindful to publish in community based publications. So again, I'm grateful that, you know, I got some things published in Montessori Public, 
you know, the AMI um, journal is somewhat community grounded as opposed to those things where you have to pay to be able to check those things out. And so I couldn't even send my own research and it's mind boggling to me. I can't even send my own research to folk. I got to send them to go buy it. To, and I'm like, it's my research. What do you mean I can't send it? So you just have to be smart enough to go ahead and tweak your studies to change it up some so you can put it in the community, the free community-based things so that you can go ahead and allow the community to then be able to, um, you know, because the academy, I mean, that's why they even call it an ivory tower, you know, so folk are up and away from the people. So you got to go ahead and be smart enough to be able to put your research in community-based um, journals or, you know, vehicles so that the people can go ahead and really glean from it what they're going to get from it and then be able to make the best of some of the research that you have and so from you know myself here with AMI USA I'm excited I don't think AMI USA ever had a you know a leader who was a researcher and so our I've, you know, I mean that's why we even have this research panel that's happening in our presentation this year because I want to let Montessorians know without a shadow of a doubt research is critical Research in the Montessori, I mean, I'm reading, you know, Dr. Montessori's work again, I'm reading The Absorbent Mind, and you can't go just a few pages to realize how immersed in her literature Dr. Montessori was. Dr. Montessori, I mean, she talks time in and time out about some of the different research projects, the folk in the laboratory who were doing X, Y, and Z right in her times, and so she was a researcher. And so if we are true Montessorians, we also need to be immersed in the cutting edge research that's happening. And in fact, what I wanna do is, you know, I saw some of your sponsors. We need to get some folk to sponsor us because I wanna go ahead and put some money on the table so that action research can happen. So that those Montessorians in the classroom are doing some action research so that they also realize that they are a part of developing some of the new knowledge that's gonna help to advance our arena. So maybe I've rambled too much, but I hope I answered the question. <laughs> That's a great point. And I want to add to that too. Um, the Journal of Montessori Research is an open access publication. So those articles are things that you can access um, on an open basis. And there are more and more of them all of the time. But we're in this weird time in academia where there are still some of those high tier peer reviewed journals that you want to be visible in from a legitimacy standpoint within the academy but you have to find other ways of making sure the field is aware of that work. So I know that AMI USA has the Montessori Minute, I think it is, that shares articles about or highlights of research studies that have been done. And AMI, AMS has um, the Research Digest that comes out quarterly. So I know the organizations, even if you don't access the full text of these studies, it gives you the, the awareness of the studies that are out there and you can usually access them through university folks um, if you need to get the full text. 